This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www.carriagehouseviolins.com. This episode of Cello Chat is brought to you by Carriage House Violins of Johnson String Instrument. Please visit us at www. If uh, I wanted to come up with any kind of a specific topic to talk about, um, and of course, anyone is welcome to ask anything you like. I'm happy to address any question at all concerning playing, playing in an orchestra, auditions, whatever you like. But just to kick things off, I was uh, thinking it might be useful to talk about one of my main concerns as a principal player, principal string player in an orchestra, which is bow speed. Um, it's it's a huge topic and it's something that I've come to recognize as really um, crucial to an understanding of how to create phrase shapes on a string instrument. Uh, in order to do that, it's important that everybody be on the same page with an understanding of the effect of bow speed. Um, simply put, bow speed is the one control that we have over the amplitude of our vibrating medium, which is string. And anyone who's taken a, a rudimentary physics course understands that amplitude is just a fancy Latin word meaning amount. It's the amount that any vibrating medium tra travels from one extreme to the other, whether it's an air column, a piano string, or a cello string. Um, and as I happen to have my instrument here, one of my instruments. So as the string moves back and forth like this, side to side, it, dis it displaces air molecules. And by doing that, it creates waves that consist of areas of density and its opposite, attenuation and density those waves or areas of attenuation and density hit our ears, they make our eardrums vibrate and our brains interpret that as sound. And the amount of the amplitude is interpreted as loudness. And this is the one aspect of this that I, I want to discuss. Um, we all know that there are basically three variables that we deal with. Uh, with our bows as string players. There's the contact point, there's pressure, and there's bow speed. Um, it's amazing to me, even now, even among professionals, how little recognition there is that pressure does not create loudness. Bow speed, bow speed and only bow speed creates amplitude and therefore loudness. It's exactly analogous to the speed with which a pianist strikes a key. And it's that which controls the amount the string vibrates from side to side. Everything else is in addition to loudness. Now, um, the problem with this is that we're faced with the fact that if we vary one of those three variables, the sound will be different. You cannot change one of them and expect the sound to be the same. And to get a little bit more specific about my topic here, um, 
just to take this, this doesn't even exist in the real world of music, but it's the easiest way to demonstrate what I'm talking about and why it's problematic. Let's see if I can aim this toward my bow. Okay. Um, if we have speed X, let's call this, you know, two miles an hour. And we have a rhythm that consists, let's say just theoretically, we have a rhythm that's in four, four, and it consists of a dotted half note and a quarter note. One, two, three, four. Okay, that's the simplest representation of the problem I want to discuss. And I see this happen all the time. Players will not, they prefer not to grapple with this reality, the changing, one of those three variables will change the sound. And I see this happening a lot. Okay, so if you do not change your contact point or your pressure, then you'll get this effect. To get back to the frog in time for the next downbeat. So the quarter note is louder. It's much louder. It sounds accented. And I see players try to finesse this by moving their contact point back and lessening pressure. So you get this effect. Okay, so it mitigates the problem somewhat, but you have a radically different sounding quarter note with relation to the dotted half note. This is why we use hooked bowings. It's the only way around this problem so, so that you can maintain a constant bow speed. If each note needs to have the same sound and volume, same sound quality, palette if you prefer, timbre, and volume, all three variables must remain the same. So the solution is hooked bowing, as most of us know. <laughs> So that's one way of solving the problem. Um, unfortunately, in the real world, it's not always so, uh, so clear cut. The problem is not always so easy to, uh, to address. Uh, I just off the top of my head, before I went on, I was thinking of a couple of real life examples. Um, the first one that occurred to me is toward the beginning of the Dvorak Concerto, which is a piece I'm sure we're all very familiar with. Um, it's the little episode where uh, it modulates to C major. This. If you look at the score, you'll see that the Sforzandi are on the downbeats, the tonic beats of each group of four in slow motion. So many players, um, and I used to beat my students over the head about this, are again, not taking into account this problem of bow speed because you have four sixteenths in a down bow and then you have one sixteenth note on an up bow. And without making a certain adjustment, which we'll talk about in a second, you get the effect of a sforzando, an unbalanced sforzando on the fourth of each group of four sixteenths. <laughs> heard this but that's not what's written what's written is sorry uh, okay so, so it's on the tonic beats of each group of four how do we do this so in this case excuse me for the new york city fire department outside my window we need to travel in the air, not on the string, on the single note. Okay, so that's one way of getting around that. Another uh, very similar example is in the last movie of the Brahms Double Concerto. Very tricky bowing. Okay, so it's 
it's an eighth followed by two sixteenths. And the first two notes are slurred. So if you don't pay attention to this, you get this effect. Again, the solution here is to travel in midair. So those are two similar problems. Now, um, another example I wanted to bring up, and I see this all the time, and it's not player's fault because this is something that's been reproduced in just about every print edition of, of the piece, which is the first movement of the Elgar cello concerto. And if you look at the sources, you'll see that this bowing was added by another hand, probably Felix Salmond, I don't know. But the main theme, I see people, it, it's, Elgar just wrote one slur per bar, but there's an up bow marked in the last third of each bar. So you get this effect. Again, I'll tilt this down. beats down, one beat up. That's a problem. That's a problem because this theme falls into two, two bar periods. One bar up, one bar down. And it, it, even without listening to the harmonization, this is pretty obvious and it's, it's arc shape, but if you, if you look at the orchestra part, um, it's harmonized with a half diminished seventh in the first of the two bars, and then it resolves to the e, back to the E minor. Okay, so there's a tension and a resolution. So how do we deal with this? In an ideal world where you didn't have to project over the XYZ Philharmonic in uh, a 2000 foot hall, you could start up bow and then do, do one bar per bow so that you're at the frog at the peak of each uh, phrase period, like this. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to um, develop enough sound volume, loudness if you prefer, with this. Boeing, it might be great for um, a recording of the piece where you're mic'd closely, but um, you need a different, a better solution, again, in real life, if you're playing in a large hall with a powerful orchestra. Um, this is a Boeing that I suggest to my students, which sort of, it, it splits the bow, but in, I think, a more sophisticated way than what you see uh, in the print editions which is, and it gives you less bow where you don't need a lot of bow, and it gives you more bow where you need the bow at the peak of each two bar period that is surrounding the bar line. So if you start up bow, down bow, another down bow, now two bars down. So the net effect, So you, you, the first step is recognizing that this is a problem. And the second step is figuring out how to work around that so that you're not, your bow is not um, um, dictating the music to you. You must be the master of your bow and tell it what you want it to do. You have to decide first what the shape of the phrase is and then find a bowing that will work for that, either a bowing or a, a bowing technique. Uh, here's another example. Um, those are both from the uh, concerto repertoire, from the chamber music repertoire, um, Mendelssohn A minor quartet, opus 13. Um, the way it's written looks like this. 
That's no good because you get accents where you don't want them. So that's why we use uh, hook mowings. So we have the stresses where we want them, not where the bow insists that we put them. Okay. Um, there's a corollary to the problem, which is when you're left with not enough bow, where you need more bow. Um, my favorite example is the great Schubert C major cello quintet, the very first opening phrase, which begins on a C major chord. And then after two bars, you have this diminished seventh, which is at the peak of uh, a hairpin. And this is where uh, players can very often be guilty of failing to plan ahead. So you see a certain hesitation as they approach the frog. And that happens. Um, this, is, this is actually as much, I think, a psychological problem as anything else. But if, if you recognize that you need to be accelerating the bow exponentially, then you will, you will avoid the problem of using up too much bow too early so that you're still accelerating at the moment at which the bow change occurs. Um, here's another example from the orchestral repertoire the Tchaikovsky Sixth Symphony. So uh, the double basses did easy set the tonality. And the poor bassoonist comes in <laughs> with their least favorite note on their, on their instrument. Um, and then the violas did easy, the top line of the violas finish the phrase. And I wish I had a nickel for every time I saw this happening. <laughs> because uh, orchestra players very naturally will be watching the conductor and will want to save their bows. But the problem is you're saving your bow at the very moment when you need to be spending your bow. So it's incredibly important that when you're faced with this, particularly in an orchestra where there's, there has to be an, an amount of trust going on, that everybody is going to be on, on the same page with this. Again, the exponential uh, quality of this uh, up bow. Because there's not necessarily a, uh, an accent on the arrival note in this case. There isn't. It's just a hairpin. So the bow needs to keep traveling up to the point of, uh, of the bow change. Um, here's another example from the orchestral repertoire. Um, closing theme from the Mahler Fourth Symphony. And so forth. Um, it seems like a simple melody, but it's it's very important that you start at the correct part of the bow so that you're not tempted to use up too much bow in the wrong places or too little bow. Uh, in this case, what do we, first again, to not to have the, the tail wag the dog, we need to have a clear understanding of how we want to shape the phrase. Da -dum, da -dum, da -da 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 -da. Obviously it's going to the high B. Everything before that is sort of leading up to that. So we want to avoid lumps or bumps in all of the notes leading up to that. Um, so looking more closely at it, this, these uh, five eighth notes are all part of a crescendo that leads to the B natural, but there is not an accent on the B natural. Okay, so working backwards from that, we need to be in the, at the tip or at least the upper half for the beginning of those five notes. So working backwards from that, where does that leave us? We want to be here. And we have a dotted quarter note before that. And 
before that we have so the net effect i believe is that we need to start in the middle or the upper half to leave us enough time enough bow to use the bow here okay if we make the mistake of starting here for example you'll hear an accent on that note. And I've seen that happen. Um, so we need to be very careful with uh, the bow economy here. <laughs> Staying in the same neighborhood of the bow here so that we're not forcing the sound and we're not playing too loud too soon. <laughs> this note particularly cannot stick out. <laughs> Accelerate. So um, those are a few examples that I wanted to, to bring up from the solo repertoire, the chamber repertoire, and the orchestral repertoire. I'm trying to remember if there's anything I left out. Um, yeah, those were basically um, the examples that I wanted to bring out. So um, if anybody has any questions about that or anything else, um, I'm looking at my chat window right now. Um, the first question I see here says, at times while playing in the cello section of an orchestra, I struggle to hear myself and worry I'm making the section sound out of tune. Have you ever had a similar worry? If so, how do you make sure you're contributing a net positive to the sound of your section? Well, that's a really great question. That's probably the hardest thing about playing in an orchestra is figuring out how you fit into the blend of the section. And believe me, um, if you're playing in a section of 12 players, um, it's a very important question. Um, part of it comes from experience. Uh, I can't give you a magic word, but I think I think that most players deal with this question by playing at a level at which they can just be conscious of the volume and sound quality they're producing and no more. Um, if you're sticking out too much, um, obviously that's gonna cause waves. If you're overly cautious about it and really don't play out at all, you're not contributing that's I understand that this is the it's the essence of the uh, of the questioner's uh, remark for me as a leader um, I, I tend probably to push the sound a little bit more meaning I play a little bit louder than everybody not always just at certain key moments um, probably because mm, my section has expressed to me many times that they would like to be more conscious of what I'm doing so they can match that. Um, but as a basic thing, I would say just the level where you're able to determine what you're doing and no more is probably a good rule of thumb, you know? Um, as far as intonation goes, um, playing in an orchestra is unfortunately not just a matter of playing in tune with yourself or even of playing with, in tune with your colleagues, but you're, you're you're required to play in tune with completely different instrument families. Um, you know, with cellists, orchestral cellists very often find themselves in the position of having to match bass notes with bassoons and trombones. You know, so if you just have a, you might be, you might suddenly be aware that the bassoons are placing it just a couple of cents sharp, you know, the, Trombones, I don't mean this is a real world example. I'm just, you know, they might be a little lower than that. And the double basses might be somewhere else entirely. Um, so as a section leader at times, I've gone to talk to uh, leaders of other sections and just saying, let's, let's determine exactly where the center of this pitch will be. And then we'll all be on the same page. Otherwise, everybody has to listen very carefully. and. Um, as I'm fond of saying, you know, any kind of live music is all about listening. If you're not listening, you ought not to be there. Um, so hopefully, theoretically, ideally, 
everybody's got their ears sharpened out, ready to hear, and you can make mic microscopic adjustments as you go along. Um, but that's a, that's a big challenge. Um, anybody who's played chamber music with a wind instrument, for example, the Brahms clarinet trio. <laughs> Wow, it's really simple once you're by yourself uh, playing the introductory theme, but <laughs> once you're playing with a clarinet, which typically uses very little vibrato, you have to rein that in, otherwise there's no way you're going to blend. Um, and uh, that's the same, I would say, playing in the section of an orchestra, to go back to the poster's original question. Um, in big moments, it's very, very human and very tempting to ladle on a lot of vibrato. Um, it's a good example. From second symphony. We all want to go. It's going to create a lot of difficulties in the context of a section of 10 or 12 players. So you need to, I think we all realize after a certain amount of experience and, and experimenting and listening that you really need to be playing more like and create the quality with your right hand. Make sure that there's the sound is not forced, that you're using enough bow speed at the correct contact point to create a good quality sound without squeezing and without feathering the sound and not trying to create quality through vibrato. It's almost always a mistake especially in upper registers. Um, let's see. Okay. Question from Jonathan. What are your views on serial non-vibrato as a way to create color and musicality? Uh, interesting. Maybe I just addressed that. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by serial non-vibrato, but uh, I'm assuming that you mean from note to note. Um, it's a particular color. Um, occasionally, if we're playing earlier music, like the Messiah, for example, uh, a conductor will ask us to play with a vibrato, which I enjoy doing a lot. Um, I did that a lot playing Cycle of the Box Suites on um, a period instrument, and it was very educational for me to learn about how to create quality just with my right hand. Uh, as I said, I think the role of vibrato in creating a good sound is exaggerated. Um, it's nice to have it. It's good if you can do it without. Um, that said, in the context of um, playing in an orchestra, it's good to know when you need to rein that in and when you can just let the reins go. Uh, but you have to remember, in a section of 12 players, you're all individuals and some people might be vibrating up to the note, others might be vibrating around the note, some people might be vibrating down to the note, I don't know, um, with different scopes. So it's, it's a very good general idea, I think, just to, to keep it very moderate and not exaggerated. Here's a question from Ben. Can you talk more specifically about the relationship between bow changes and bow speed in different contexts? Um, Okay, um, I hope I address some of that with my different examples. But again, um, I would say that the most common error I see is that people hesitate in a crescendo as they travel toward the frog and park their bows before the peak of the haircut, as I was, as I was demonstrating. So you need, you need to experiment in your own practice with seeing how smooth a real hairpin you can create without making an accent on the note. In other words, this is, this is the bad example. And here's something more approaching what I would see as ideal. So by the, you're starting at, at speed X, call it, you know, two miles an hour. By the time you get here, you're traveling five miles an hour and you should be five miles an hour on either side of the bow chain. So going from two, five miles an hour. And it's not like you're, what you want to avoid is a dip back down to two miles an hour before you go five miles an hour on the down bow. You want 
equal speeds and equal speed limit on either side of the bow change. Um, this is why I'm not a big fan of loopy bow changes. Because look what it does to your, it forces your bow to go away from the bridge and it changes your contact point. Changing your contact point is changing one of your three major variables in creating uh, a sonority. And if you do this automatically, changing your bow, then you're losing core, okay? So you need to keep the contact point the same as you're increasing the bow speed. Otherwise, you're, yes, you're getting louder, but you're changing the sound quality as well. So I would say, if anything, if you're going to angle your bow, I would angle it this way, which will force the bow down toward the bridge. Don't take my word for it. Try it yourself. It's a, it's a rule of physics. If you do this, if you push the bow away from you as you play a down bow, see what happens? And then the opposite, if you pull the frog towards you, it goes now. I'm exaggerating hugely. But as a player um, who has to deal with um, playing in an orchestra with a very powerful brass section in large spaces, I would rather, if I'm going to make an error either way, I want it to be towards more core. Uh, that said, ideally, you shouldn't be monkeying around changing any of those variables at that point. Keep the bow change straight. Okay, um, let's see. How does your playing differ as a principle of a section versus playing tutti? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I was mentioning sort of tangentially a while ago that uh, sometimes I might push my sound a little bit to be heard just so my colleagues can hear what I'm doing, but that's, that's rare and that's probably um, really not normal. Uh, normally I'm just trying to blend with everybody else. Um, I am assuming you're not talking about section solos. If I'm playing a section solo, like, I don't know, um, any random example, uh, William Tell. Um, I'll play like I would if I were playing a concerto. I'm, I'm playing with a lot of core, a lot of volume. If it says piano, I'm probably playing forte. Sorry, folks, that's, that's the reality of it. When you're playing a cello in a large hall, it's not like playing a trumpet or a flute. You really have to put on a lot of sound to project in that kind of a space. Again, if you're playing in a string quartet or in a situation with a close microphone, that's different. But to do something like that, all right. <sighs> I'll angle this down and show you where I put my contact point for that solo, which is Mark Mezzo piano, perhaps. It's down here, really close to the bridge. Same thing, especially since it's marked mute. <laughs> uh, I had a colleague in the Philharmonic years ago who um, took pity on me and he had taken an ordinary tort mute like this. <laughs> and he had sliced it, he had sliced off the sides. So it was just basically a long rectangle. So there's hardly anything to it. <laughs> He said, here, use this so that you can feel that you've satisfied the, uh, the moral requirement for using a mute, but it'll hardly, it'll hardly affect the sound at all. So uh, I'll put that in my memoir. Um, let's see, some more questions. 
Here's a question from Claire. Thank you for your time. Hey, I'm having a good time. I'm glad you are too. About the usage of the bow, no swells or off sounds. How do you begin to identify the issue and then how to solve it and then practice it correctly? Well, um, as I would always tell my students, um, getting better at something that requires technique um, is first recognizing that there's a problem. Step two is recognizing what's causing the problem. Step three is figuring out what you can do to negate the effect of that problem. Okay, so I hope I've been clear about that in what I've been talking about. The problem that I started out talking about was um, too much bow or too little bow in the context of creating a smooth phrase. So that's recognizing the problem. What's causing the problem? Too much bow speed or not enough bow speed. And that usually has to do with a bad bowing um, or incorrect use of the bow. Step three, how do you correct that? Change the bowing or change the way you're using the bow. So um, my first example was this. A hooked bowing in that case fixes the problem because then you can maintain a constant bow speed. In a bowing like this, um, from the Dvorak, I was using that example because you can't hook that in, you could, but it's, it's very awkward and, and difficult. So in that case, you train yourself to recover the up bow in the air. So that you can maintain the sforzanti where they belong on the first note of each group of four. And you can allow yourself a little drift toward the, toward the tip because then you can recover at the end of the bar. Okay, now I'm in the upper half. Recover, start again at the frog. So there, you know, there are ways around that, but it's always a three-step process. Is there a problem? What's causing it? How do I fix it? Uh, okay. Um, here's a question from Will Hayes. What advice do you have to aspiring orchestral players? How does one prepare for this career path? Well, um, as with anything else, you need to um, improve yourself as a player as much as you can. I mean, that's entirely independent of what career path you're gonna follow. And when I say a player, I include the word musician as well. You need to have a variety of experiences, not just your solo stuff, but a lot of chamber music and a lot of orchestra playing so that you train yourself to be able to listen vertically, to be able to listen in real time to what your colleagues are doing um, so that the there's a constant stream of input, like watching a film strip. You know it's about to come. You're anticipating that. In the lens, you see what's going on at this very moment. And then you're also anticipating that it's going to go by and what's coming next. A very simple example might be um, if you're accompanying a flute solo that's eight bars long. And typically, the flute player will need to take a breath at the end of bar four. So they need to have a little bit of time for that. <laughs> Otherwise, they're gonna turn blue. So it's just, I mean, this is a very simple example, but you need to be sort of empath musically empathetic to the point where you're putting them, yourself in their shoes, anticipating that they're going, there's going to be an inflection point there. So if you're, if you're going as an accompaniment, and you start to let your mind wander and think, oh, I have to buy milk on the way home today. And they, they need to take a breath at the end of bar four. You're going to step on them at the beginning of bar five. It would be too soon. So that's just a stupid example, but that's basically what I'm talking about. Um, question from Peter. Do you, oh, I'm sorry, just to finish my response to, to Will's question. You also need to start building up a, a, a library, I mean, an actual physical library, either on your iPad or in a big banker's box, as I did, of excerpts, solo excerpts and section excerpts. Um, you know, all of the Brahms, this, the famous Strauss, Mahler, Tchaikovsky, Beethoven, Mozart, 
Um, there's a ton of it out there. And the best way to do that probably is just to have a look at what orchestras are posting uh, as audition lists. A lot of the stuff just comes around again and again, and you'll see it typically on any list. Some audition committees like to be a little creative and ask for something a bit unusual. Um, so build up that list, practice it a lot, put it in the context of the piece as a whole. Don't make the mistake of just learning those eight bars. Learn the pieces, learn what the context is. Believe me, all of that goes into your confidence level when you go out on stage to play the arch. Um, here's a question from Peter. Do you have any tips on coordinating the left and right hand, both in timing and relationship between how much vibrato is appropriate for how, how much bow? Um, that's a really broad question. Uh, I'm not sure how, how to address that. Uh, again, I think it begins with what you want to have happen musically. So if you start with a, a clear concept of the shape of the phrase that you want to create, or the articulation that you want to use, or um, the phrase direction, that generally will suggest to you the, the solution. Um, as far as how much vibrato is appropriate for how much bow, I don't think it has that much to do with how much bow you're using as how much vibrato adds to the, um, the glow and, and the beauty of the sound before it starts drawing attention to itself. And, you know, we're all individuals, we have individual taste. Uh, if you go on YouTube, you can hear Daniel Schaffron, for example, play with what I might euphemistically call a very individual vibrato. Something like that. For me, that's too much. Other people love it. Um, my colleague, Stephen Isolis, adores his playing. So, I mean, there's no right or wrong. It's, um, you know, we're, it, it's really what you desire to hear. Um, so it's, it's uh, there's no hard and fast rule according to that. But I would say just, again, pay very, very good attention to the role of the right hand in creating quality sound. And don't try to use vibrato to create quality. Uh, I would say that, that the phrase that passed my lips the most often in teaching has been, don't over vibrate because students get carried away, as we all do, being humans, by moments of great emotional import in music, and they would start over vibrating. And I would, it would be difficult even to hear what pitch was intended. So it's important to recognize that as you go up, as we all know from practicing scales, you know, the intervals are closer and uh, a high note by definition is gonna require a much narrower, perhaps even violinistic scope than something in the first half position on the C string. Um, okay, here's another question on intonation. What do you listen for when practicing intonation on notes that don't have open string resonance when playing by yourself or only with other string players? Really great question. Um, I understand what you're saying. On the other hand, at the end of the day, uh, you're going to have to base it on open strings at some point. Now, if you're playing in a key, let's say, let's take an extreme example, D flat major, which has no open strings in it, um, where do you put those pitches? Well, still D flat, itself as a key relates to the basic tuning of the instrument. I would, I would say that because you might be needing to use open strings as leading tones in other parts of the functional harmony family, even in D flat major, I would set it on the low side. Uh, what's a good example? Uh, well, okay, so if you're to, to continue with the D flat major, example, if you are um, 
if you're playing, like say a, a typical harmonic trope might be five, seven, and four. So in D flat major, your four is, D, is G flat and uh, five, seven would be. Uh, that's not a good example because that doesn't have any other strings. Okay, uh, well, it's, it's dominant. A. There's one open string note in the A flat dominant seven, which is a C. Okay, so that has to relate. That's my point. At some point uh, in a piece like that, in a piece in D flat major, even open strings will will have a role somehow. So uh, in that case. The, the third degree of the A flat chord. If you want to hear that a little bit as a as a uh, as a leading tone. So in that case, you know, but there might be an open C string in there. So you have to you have to compromise and recognize that that's going to also be uh, a factor. Uh, Claire asks, what would you say is the order of importance when learning a piece? What is the progression? Notes, rhythms, metronome work, intonation, dynamics to make my practice highly effective or efficient? Another really great question. Um, just speaking for myself, and I'm sure everybody has their own way of approaching it. Um, my concept of memorization is associative. In other words, to put it in the simplest terms, one thing leads to the next. Uh, I actually heard that from Lauren Mazel, who was famous for having a supposedly uh, eidetic memory, where uh, he, could, he could see things. But really, uh, in conversation with him, I realized that for him, it was, it was more a process of association. So in learning a piece, I'll try to if it's if it's a tonal piece, um, I'll try to gain an understanding of its harmonic structure. This is leading to this is leading to this. Uh, that's a great way to to memorize. If it's atonal, then I'll do it by gesture. Then this gesture is leading to this gesture. But always there's a sense, almost always there's a sense of uh, harmony or gesture leading to the next thing. So I'll try to rough out in my mind a feeling for that. And when I use the word feeling, um, I do mean that there's almost a palpable sense of shapes being created in the air. Um, and then, um, then I'll add things like dynamics. Met metronome work is always there, of course. It's, extremely, it's an extremely useful tool. Um, I use my metronome almost every day, I would say. And uh, it's, it's a humbling experience to play with a metronome very often. Uh, and intonation, I was just talking about in another, in another context. Intonation doesn't exist in a vacuum. Things relate to other things. Robert asks, what is your most memorable moment as principal cellist in the New York Phil through the years? Um, <laughs> okay. Um, well, I would say just the most amazing thing that ever happened. I'm afraid this isn't very musical, but since you asked, we, many years ago, we were playing the Brahms Violin Concerto with Kim Wa Chung and Andre Previn conducting. And there's a moment just before the big peroration, before the, the cadenza, where the violinist, it uh, plays this huge uh, A dominant run. Like that, and the orchestra comes in with their, uh, with their uh, tutti before the cadenza. And so she, Cookie went up for that high C sharp, leaned way back for it. And I looked up and suddenly she wasn't there. And, I, I looked 
at the stage in front of Andre and her high heeled shoes were still on stage. She had actually leaned so far back that she fell out of her shoes into the arms of Mark Ginsburg, our principal second violinist. <laughs> and of course, everything ground to a halt. We were just, <laughs> what? And she picked herself up. Her violin was fine. She you know, still was holding the violin. And Andre was still, had his arms still up like this. And he looked at her and he said, would you like to try that again? <laughs> <laughs> so that was that was the most memorable moment, I have to say. Um, I'm sorry it wasn't, you know, playing piece XYZ with conductor ABC, uh, although there have been many memorable moments. The Tchaikovsky 6 with Mazur sticks out in my mind as something quite wonderful. Um, but usually when people ask me what's the thing I think about immediately when they ask me what's the most amazing thing you ever witnessed. It was Cookie Chung falling out of her shoes in the Brahms Concerto. Uh, let's see. Well, that seems to be all of the questions for now, unless I'm mistaken. Um, anybody else with the, uh, oh, here we go. How does one improve shifts in Strauss's Ein Heldenleben? I'm glad you asked me that. That's a good question. Okay. Um, so playing good shifts in Ein Heldenleben presupposes that you have a good understanding of the Heldenleben style, which is basically incredibly broad. Um, it's a little bit like the Elgar Concerto in that respect, I would say. Uh, but anyway, at least I, I know you're referring probably to the, the first page. Um, and it's very important that those shifts are anticipated, that they're early and slow. So... Uh, <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a dotted eight sixteenth, but I hear a lot of people do this. It's like the Indianapolis Speedway. Um, and then again, uh, and I, I always say that it's due to what we call black note disease. So you look at the, uh, you look at your part, John Heldenleben, or any of the Strauss tone poems, Alpine Symphony, Don Juan, there's a lot of ink on the page. Um, and I think it tends psychologically to freak players out. But you have to remember that Unheldenleben actually, you know, for this first couple of pages, moves at a very leisurely pace. One, two, three, four. It's just, there's a lot of room for the 16th notes. They're slow. Ba da 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 da. Bum ba da. Try it yourself, you'll see. So um, it's important that you integrate your shift into this leisurely feeling of the music. And you can, you can articulate that just before your arrival at the note so that you really get a full 16th note out of that. So I'm really taking my time. Not. Lots of time. So don't freak out, don't panic. Just play it like the most beautiful sustained song you've ever heard in your life. Question from Lisa. Can you speak to mental preparation just before a performance? How do you keep your nerves in check? Great question. Um, nerves are always a factor for everybody. If they say they're not, they're lying to you. I've compared notes with many of my principal player colleagues and everybody has a, a bit noir in their closet. Um, I used to talk to Phil Smith, our now retired principal trumpet about starting the, uh, the Mahler Fifth Symphony. You know, it's the trumpet players all by themselves him or herself, um, and it's a very, it's a very demanding passage. Um, 
it's very easy to work yourself into a state beforehand by thinking thinking about being nervous itself will create nerves it's that's it's a big problem and there's a you can create a feedback loop for yourself in doing that so the way i deal with that is i try to it, it requires mental discipline in addition to preparation and all of that but that's that's easy to say and i think nerves really have nothing to do with the difficulty of the passage it's really all about feeling nakedly offered up on a plate that's what makes um principal solo is more difficult than playing a concerto, for example, because suddenly you have to step out of your role as a section player and you're at the footlight suddenly and you're exposed and then, and then you're not anymore. It's very challenging. Um, passages like the act one of Die Valkyra by, by Wagner, a famous cello passage there, uh, where everything just stops and it's just you nobody else, just the cello. Very quiet and technically not really a very demanding passage, but it's very scary because, because of the psychological context. So I try, my mental discipline is to try to turn that part of my mind off and stay focused on the present like that. Um, also, I find that closing my eyes can help a lot. Um, Keeping, keeping out the visual aspect of having a conductor standing there looking at you, all of your, your colleagues pretending to look at their toes, but not really. Um, it's very different from playing as a soloist. Uh, so I would say uh, it, it's difficult to describe, but the mental discipline I'm after is not too much anticipation. That's what gets you in trouble. So just stay focused on the present, doing what you need to do. And that can help a lot. Uh, also, you know, practicing it a lot uh, is certainly part of the part of the process. Can you speak a little? Here's another question. Can you speak a little about shaping your tone and getting better at hearing in larger phrases rather than the individual notes? Um, yeah, I mean that's a basic musicianship question. Uh, what do I have on my music stand here? give you as an example. Um, okay, well, here's a piece we just finished playing this week. It's the Tchaikovsky uh, Winter Dream Symphony. It's one of the symphonies that's not played very often. It's one of his early symphonies. Um, but there's a famous tune that keeps going around in the various instrumental families on the second movement. Uh, if you'll forgive me, I'll play a little bit of this for you as an example. It goes like it's an it's an A flat major. Okay, so. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's an eight bar phrase period right there. Um, it falls basically into your usual four bar and four bar phrase period shape. So um, a danger of something like this is to fail to sustain. And this, this has a lot to what I was starting to talk about at the beginning of the hour with uh, bow planning. You need to plan ahead. Um, so you have bar one. <laughs> two, bars three and four. Uh, now in this, at the end of bar four, he modulates to F minor. So I think um, a mistake uh, a player could conceivably make would be to fail to sustain into that in, at the end of bar four. So that the F minor, which is the relative minor of A flat major, is sort of dissociated from first four bars or has nothing to do with it. Um, it's important that you, that you recognize what's going on in terms of the length of the phrase, the length of the subphrases, and how the uh, harmonic underpinnings relate to each other. So in this case, I want to sustain and 
increase the intensity going to the relative minor. So on the C natural, I'm going to accelerate my bow. Without making an accent. So I hope that's a maybe a specific example that illustrates the, the general nature of your question. Here's another one. Can you discuss the process of developing your personal sound or sound character? Every great musician has a sound that is identifiable. You know exactly who's playing without seeing them, whether it's Dan Daniel Schafran or Rostropovich. How do we work on this and not become poor versions of our teachers or idols? And how does one balance that when playing or auditioning in an orchestra? Super good question. Really, really good. Um, one of the saddest things I see as a professional is when I see a player of a certain age, in other words, old enough that they should know better, still mimicking all of the mannerisms and tropes of uh, a, a great player who had a lot of influence on them as a youngster. Um, I saw this starting to happen to myself as a young player um, because I, I loved Rostropovich a lot. Um, and I started to recognize as a, at the beginning of my career as, as a young soloist that I was tending to copy a lot of his mannerisms um, with the, the occasional notes with no vibrato and um, the, the, the heavy, heavy vibrato and, and uh, heavy core sound all the time. Um, I recognized that in myself and there was, there was sort of an Oedipal moment where I tried to cast off that mooring so that I could be myself. I don't know if I succeeded, but it, it definitely was a conscious process on my part. It's something that everybody probably should try to go through. Um, and it's why um, in my teaching at, at Curtis and various other places, I really tried to avoid a lot of demonstrating and lessons because I, I, I recognized what a danger that was. And I, I really didn't want to create a little army of mini me's. Uh, besides, I mean, all the stu students were just wonderful to hear on their own. So there was no reason to interfere with that. Aside from just trying to promulgate some basic values of what constituted good or efficient play. Um, so it all comes back to what you hear in the music and what you want to hear out of music. You, you need to see yourself as a vessel for that, for transmitting that. So, you know, in the end, everybody has their own individual take on that, which is what creates your individual sound. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, as long as you have, let's say, a range of individual sounds. I, I hope that I'm not uh, responding in the same way to a movement of Bach. As I would to to, to take two completely polar opposite examples. You, as a, a good musician, you should be cultivating a range, not just your sound whatever that means, you know. I get suspicious when everybody's, when I hear anybody say, oh, I love the blah, blah, blah orchestra. I love their sound. To me, that's an implicit criticism because it implies a lack of flexibility as a musician. Um, here's another question. How has your perspective as a musician and artist changed throughout your career? Um, hmm. Well, I mean, there's the obvious answer, which is that I left a career as a solo player to join a, a major orchestra. Um, I think that has incredibly broadened my musical horizons. There's nothing like playing in an orchestra to get you out of your own little, little world and realize that, um, is a vast repertoire out there that, that requires that it requires a certain flexibility on your part to be an accompanist as well as the carrier of the voice or as a 
middle voice, something like that. Um, it makes you a better listener, I would say. Uh, certainly also um, playing a lot of chamber music, particularly string quartets, has made me become much more conscious of the need to rein in uh, latent soloistic impulses. <laughs> Sounds like I'm talking about a skin disease. Um, but it's very important. If you're going to be a whole musician, a well-rounded musician, those are all experiences you need to have. Here's a question from Joseph Mansfield. How do you deal with the egos in the section? In other words, musicians who may have their own ideas and interpretation about a passage of music. Well, that starts with me and my ego. <laughs> I have to rein, in, rein that in all the time. Um, playing in the rotation of a section, which I did previously to my job as a principal, I played at the very back of the Cleveland Orchestra cello section. Um, and in those days, and I think it's still the case, they didn't have rotation. You just, you were in your chair. Uh, in my case, that was six stand and side. Um, and that was it. And it's, it's very difficult because uh, I'm hardy the first person to point this out. You arrive in that kind of a position having spent many years honing your craft, learning how to play as a soloist, as a chamber music player, all the rest of that. And suddenly you are a highly paid cog in someone else's musical wheel. I mean, let's face it, that's, you're, you are there to realize someone else's conception. So the way I've dealt with that is to take pleasure in the professional aspect of being as good at that as possible. You want that note short? This is gonna be a fantastic short. You're gonna, you're gonna wanna pay a jillion dollars to hear the way I play that note short. Um, or to be the, the best part of a cello section that's accompanying uh, the oboe solo. Um, you, you take pride in your ability to, to realize these things um, to the best of your ability and at an extremely high level. Now, the principal player, of course, has a little more leeway as far as that goes. Um, just to give you an example, again, off the top of my head, I see my main job is to make it, to create a comfortable environment it took me decades to come around to realizing this finally, but really my job is best described, I think, is creating a comfortable environment in which all the players in my section can do their best work. Because they're all wonderful players. They could all play principal perfectly well. Um, so I'm there to not to throw curveballs, to do be on a mission for something or prove something. I just want them to feel really at ease so they can play beautifully. Uh, we were playing the accompaniment to the Dvorak cello concerto and there's a famously thorny um, passage uh, in the slow movement where the horn, the horn section plays a chorale. You know, the, the... And the cellos and basses have to play an accompaniment to that, which is fiendishly difficult because, well, for a number of reasons, it's a slow tempo. The French horn as an instrument takes a while to develop its sound. It's a very wide sort of non-specific sound, but the cello and bass part is. <laughs> It's very specific and the notes are short and they have to be placed exactly right. And the conductor was suggesting a ricochet bowing. And I rolled my eyes, to be honest. And the conductor said, well, let's try it. So I said, okay, we'll try anything once. And as I predicted, it was an unholy mess. It, it was noisy and it wasn't together. So I said, please allow me to make this suggestion. And I turned to my section on the bases and I said, 
let's play it at the tip on the string using this much bow super late, as, soon, as late as possible, which is a way of making everybody feel technically very at ease and most importantly, able to respond to nuances in the French horn playing. Da, 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 da. So when you're out there, there's no stress to it. So this is just a specific example of, of what I mean when I say that it's important that I create a technically comfortable space with my choice, with my choice of bowings and articulations, as long as it's not conflicting too much with the conductor's overall concept. Um, okay, so our administrator is saying that that marks the end of the questions. If you can give any closing remarks, that would be great. And I'll let you know once the live broadcast has stopped. Um, I think we covered a lot of territory. It was really fun um, to talk about this and to, uh, to hear some really great questions. I hope I, hope I was able to address them honestly uh, and constructively. Uh, good luck to everybody. Thank you.